few minutes ago on uh, this whole word, uh, ferme. <laughs> so I, I honestly didn't know if it was a spelling issue or if this was really a word. So, so then when I heard David said he couldn't spell, I thought, so that, that answered my question. But then he came back around and explained that that actually is a word. So, all right, it's all good. I kept looking at the poster seriously and going, did they misspell this word? But down here it says firm. So they couldn't have like, I got it. All right, it's good. All right, so I want to talk uh, to you guys today about, I'm just calling this the case for God. So we're just going to look uh, real briefly, kind of just at the, the, just the whole topic of atheism and just kind of, you know, give a, uh, a basic outline of how to think about atheism in a sense and, and how to respond to um, atheistic claims. And, and of course, you know, it's, uh, it's fashionable in our current cultural moment to be an atheist. It, it's now like cool. And so you meet many, many more people today than you might have met you know, 15, 20 years ago that, that talked publicly about being an atheist and really identified as an atheist and had you know, some sort of a, um, argument for, for their position. So that, that's kind of um, you know, where, where, where we're at in the culture today. So that, that's what I want to do. I want to address that topic. And I'm going to just read a couple of verses from Romans chapter 1. And I'll read verses uh, 18 through verse 20. And it says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and divine nature so that they are without excuse. They are without excuse. You know, let, let me just say this too as, as we get started on this topic. Um, you know, atheists are, you know, part of their whole thing is intimidation. I don't know if you've ever noticed this or not, but they, you know, they, they come off as, you know, very intellectual. They come off as, um, you know, very condescending to others and you know like if, if you if you don't get this stuff then you're just you know you're an idiot I mean that's oftentimes the way uh, they, they present it and you know they 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 claim to have some great understanding that only the elite have uh, but listen when you when you really think about what they're saying and 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 you start to break it down it, it's just it's, it's really nonsensical. Um, and, and I think what we, the reason I'm saying this is because sometimes we feel like we're on the defensive with the atheists. Like, oh man, they've got so many things and we gotta, you know, they're, they're just attacking us right and left. But, you know, I think we need to understand that, no, we have the upper hand. We have the advantage because what I like to say to an atheist when they want to criticize my Christian faith or my, you know, biblical worldview, I just simply say this to them. Well, why don't you tell me your worldview? Why don't you tell me what it's all about? Why don't you tell me what is, what is your hope? Uh, what, what does life mean based upon your perspective? And in the end, uh, you know, they don't have a good view. <laughs> they, they have a view that is very... Um, uh, it's, it's nihilism, it's, it's, it's bleak, it's, uh, you know, there, there's no hope. Uh, you know, if you, if you truly hold to the tenets of atheism, then life has no meaning, life has no purpose, there is no hope. And you know what? I just flat out reject that as, uh, 
you know, as, as a theory. It's like, no, everything in me as a human being says, no, there, there is a purpose. Everything in me says, no, you know, life does have a meaning. So in a sense, even rather than getting into all the detailed arguments with them, you know, you can just simply say, look, I, I think your worldview sucks. I, I don't, I'm not even remotely interested in it because it, it just makes zero sense. It makes zero sense. It gives you uh, no hope for the future. It gives you no basis for your existence. And, um, you know, it, there, it's fraught with so, so many problems. So with that said, what, what we're going to do is we're going to just take a quick walk through what are called uh, the classical arguments uh, for theism or, or arguments for the existence of God. Now, the passage that we read in Romans, as you can see, uh, God says here through the Apostle Paul, uh, God says that atheists are inexcusable. Uh, they, they basically have no excuse for their atheism because uh, the, the created order is a testimony to God's existence, to, to his power. Uh, the the invisible things of God are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. So God expects people to look at uh, the created order. God expects you to look in the mirror and draw this conclusion. There, there is a God. There is a creator. And God says the person who doesn't do that is inexcusable. There's, there's no excuse for atheism. So the, the classical arguments and so the classical arguments are arguments that have, have uh, been around for many centuries. Um, people like Thomas Aquinas and, and others would have um, Anselm and some of these, these people back in, in history, they would have been the thinkers that thought through these kinds of things. And they're, they're arguments that are good, and I think they're, they're interesting. And I think it's um, I, I think it's good that that we get to know them. They're not arguments that are necessarily based on scripture. Uh, so there are there are arguments that are kind of in addition to scripture. And so some of them are stronger than others, but it, it's a fact that through these kinds of arguments or through the ideas that are presented through these arguments, uh, people who have uh, been unbelievers have been brought to faith, or at least, you know, sometimes we say that um, apologetics is pre-evangelism. So apologetics oftentimes, like I said, is not dealing necessarily exactly with a scriptural text, but what apologetics are intended to do in many ways, uh, as, you know, especially in regard to unbelievers, is to remove stumbling blocks, you know, just to get that thing out of the way that prevents a person from even considering the possibility of God. And so that's kind of what the, uh, the classical arguments for uh, God's existence do. They kind, they kind of move some of the roadblocks out uh, from before people. And so there, uh, I'll just give you the, the four that we're going to look at here today. We're going to look at the cosmological argument and then the teleological argument and the moral argument, and then uh, fourthly, we'll look at the argument from congruity, and, and then I'm gonna bring us all the way back around to, I think, the greatest uh, um, argument for the existence of God, but I'll save that for the last. So, the cosmological argument. Uh, the cosmological argument states, in essence, that the universe is an effect which must have had a cause. So th this is based on uh, the law of cause and effect. Now, we've all probably heard of that law, right? The law of cause and effect. Um, and, and what that law states is this, that the effect cannot be greater in size or kind than the cause. No exceptions to the law of cause and effect have ever been observed. If followed, uh, or it follows that every effect we see in the universe must have had a cause. So this is just consistent all, all the way as far as um, we can observe. Uh, every effect 
in the universe must have had a cause and we can trace all effects back to a first cause. So the first cause in the argument, of course, would take you back to God and God is the uncaused cause. Some, some, some people have said, well, the weakness of this argument is that um, you're, you're presenting then that, that God, is, um, God was not caused. Uh, he's not an effect. He is the first cause. Well, that's what we believe because we believe that God is eternal. And so even though that might not satisfy the philosophically minded person, um, that's where we stop. We go back to a first cause. Now, think about this. So, so the, the, the universe is, is time, space, and matter or energy, right? That's, that's how it's broken down. So looking at the cosmological argument, this is what it tells us, that the first cause of time must be greater than time because the cause is always greater the, than the effect. So the first cause of time must be greater than time, in fact, eternal. Uh, the first cause of space must be greater than space. Now think, think about space for a minute, man. Space is just, it's so insane how, um, it, you know, just the heavens themselves. And of course the Bible says that uh, the heavens are the work of God's fingers, the moon and the stars that, that he has ordained. And, and when you think about the vastness of space, it is, it's mind-boggling. It, it is ultimately inconceivable. Nobody even really knows. You know, the, now there's the, the idea that there are billions of galaxies. And we can't even fathom the, the end of, of the galaxy that we're in. But there, there's billions of galaxies. So what I'm trying to get us to comprehend here is just the space is so vast but space is an effect. So the cause of space has to be greater than the effect. And so with space, uh, the first cause must be infinite. Space, even though it's incomprehensibly vast to us, it is finite. It, it started, it will end, it has, uh, a, 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 you, you can measure it. Uh, we can't measure it, but God can measure it. And through the prophet Isaiah, he said that uh, the heavens, he, he held them in the span of his hand. That, that's a, uh, the distance between your index finger and your thumb. So that's space for God. For us, it's, it seems uh, infinite, even though it's not. So then we come to matter or energy. The first cause of all energy in the universe cannot be less than the sum total of that energy. The first cause is omnipotent. So here in the cosmological argument, you see through the, the, the law, and there are many people that would definitely say, yeah, the, it's a law of cause and effect. This is, it's always this way. That's what a law is. It's something that consistently um, just shows the same thing over and over and over again. So that gets established as a law. Cause and effect um, is the argument um, here uh, as the cosmological argument. The second is the teleological argument. And um, this argument is the argument from design or purpose. So it, it states that where there is a design, there must be a designer. Where there is purpose, there must be one who purposed it. Now, again, like I said a moment ago, just in talking more personally, uh, but I think it's true for everybody. Um, everybody senses that e even, even in your own life experience that there, there, there must be some purpose for my life. Now, there are people who despair and um, just say, you know, life is meaningless and there, there is no purpose. But if you if you got away from just the emotional aspect of it and you just started looking at some of the, the things that we see in the, in the physical realm, you would realize that you know, everything, um, there, there's a design. Think, things are very, very uniquely designed. Now we live in a world where we're perfectly familiar with design. We, we, there are people who are designers, right? And design, we're, 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 
we encounter design all day, every day, in everything around us. Um, we're living in the computer age. The computer, of course, is something that was designed. It was something that was made. It was something that uh, a lot of um, intellectual power uh, was put into. My son is a web developer, so he writes code and he builds websites and things like that. And, and he just laughs at the idea that you could have, um, you know, like the evolutionary idea is that all of this radically complex information that it just accidentally came together. And, you know, I sit sometimes and I watch him write code. I have, it's like, what are you doing? How, what, what is that? And it's a language. How did you learn that language? That is a strange language. And I have absolutely no idea how this whole thing works, but, but I'll sit there and I'll watch him and he'll, you know, he'll type out this line of code and then he'll go back and he'll, you know, it, it was supposed to do something, but it didn't do that. So he'll back up, he'll go back to the code again. And, um, you know, so when you turn on your laptop or even your phone or whatever, I mean, we just take that all for granted. But Tons of intellectual power <laughs> went into the production of this. Tons of information are in this. So we see this everywhere, right? Now, the organic world, which is what we're made of, this, we, are, we are basically machines. We are radically fine-tuned machines. So here's what the atheist wants us to believe, that all of this other stuff obviously, of course, had a designer. You'd be stupid to think that a computer just sort of randomly came together, right? Um, you know, like the idea that there was a, um, you know, tornado sweeping through a, a junkyard and it, it resulted in a Rolls Royce or something like that. You know, nobody would think that, right? But the atheist wants us to believe that we who are radically complex, we just randomly came into existence. It was just like that kind of a thing. It was just a freak accident. And, and this is what happened. So the teleological argument uh, points to design. It points to purpose. There, there isn't room really for the random kind of thing. Now, how many of you guys have ever seen Mount Rushmore? You, you know what Mount Rushmore is? It's in Montana, I think, or Wyoming, or Dakota, one of the Dakotas, somewhere over there. I've never been to that part of the country, so it's all very vague to me. But, but on Mount Rushmore, you have these, the heads of previous presidents, right? Four or five different presidents there. Now, how many of you think that that, you know, just hundreds of years, the wind blowing, the rain falling, and one day somebody woke up and walked out the door and it's like, holy smokes, look what, look what nature did. Nature put the, the, the facial images of, of these uh, presidents on the side of this mountain. Nobody thinks that would have happened, right? Except Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins, the brilliant PhD guy, he thinks that happened. At least theoretically he thinks that happened because he says that given enough time with just, you know, those natural processes that these kinds of things would happen. Richard Dawkins even says this, he says, yes, I know that everything looks complex and it is complex and it looks like there's a designer, but let me assure you there is not a designer. How do you know? I just know. I just know there was not a designer. But actually, he got pushed to a point. He said, well, maybe there was a designer. But if it was, it was a, uh, uh, an extraterrestrial being. So Richard Dawkins is happy to concede that perhaps people from other planets or beings from other planets uh, produced what we see here on Earth. But he just will not allow for God to have done it. So that, that's pretty irrational um, to me. So teleological argument, design, uh, real, real quickly, um, complexity. So like I said, everything, you know, back in the days of Charles Darwin, he looked at the cell and thought it was simple. That's why it used to be called the simple cell. They thought it was just a, kind of just a blob of, 
of jelly. What they didn't know then, and they do know now, is that a cell is so incredibly complex that in one cell, listen to this, there's trillions of cells in each of our bodies, but listen to this, in one cell, there is enough information to fill 8,000 volumes. We're talking books of, you know, 250 to 500 pages, 8,000 volumes. That's what it takes to spell out the information that's in one cell. So this is pretty complex, I would say. And of course, we're talking about the DNA and that kind of a thing here. So the cell is complex, but then there's another step you can go with this, and this is called irreducible complexity. And what irreducible complexity means is this. It's not just that the cell is complex, but that it is, it is so radically exacting that it's, you cannot uh, extract any part from it uh, without losing everything. It's all connected. And one of the things that this creates a huge problem for with the biological evolutionist, because their idea is that you know, cells over long periods of time, they, they evolved, they developed. And so, um, you know, they, so, so they, they became more complex over time, millions of years, but irreducible complexity says no. There's, that cell itself could not exist uh, without the present complexity. So it's irreducibly complex. You can't take any part out of it and still have the cell function or do what, what it's actually doing. So that's an argument from, or, or that, that would be like a teleological uh, argument because you're looking at complexity. But then purpose, uh, these are different things, right? Design is one thing, purpose is another thing. Uh, they're similar, but they're different. Um, the teleological argument says that obviously creation shows that there's a, perf a purpose. Now, some of you guys might have heard of this. It's called the anthropic principle. And anthropos is the Greek word for man, humanity. And what has now come about in the scientific world, and um, mostly intelligent design people are you know, the ones that promote this, but there are others outside uh, who have to concede that this is actually the case. The anthropic principle basically says this, that the world that we live in seems to have been prepared for us. That it, the way it, it's, it's also called the fine tuning argument, that, that everything is so fine tuned for life as we know it, complex life and human life. But let me, let me give you just two quick things that are easy to remember. Um, the sun and the moon. Now remember, atheism is, you know, generally speaking, uh, bases itself on evolutionary ideas. Evolution is, is the idea that everything happened randomly by chance. Uh, you know, there was a big bang, there was an explosion. And this is how we got to where we are today. Um, but here's what the anthropic principle causes us to realize. Regarding the sun, number one, if Earth were slightly closer to or farther from the sun, water would either freeze or evaporate, rendering Earth uninhabitable for complex life. So if you go with the atheist view, then that means at this explosion, the earth and the sun, you know, in the solar system and all that, it all landed just perfectly. And it stayed there in this perfect position. Not only the sun, but the moon. If, if earth did not have a moon, listen, the right size and distance, it would be uninhabitable. The moon stabilizes the Earth's tilt, preventing extreme temperatures and thus creating a stable, life-friendly environment. So you see, here's the question. 
is the is the earth and the sun is their relationship uh is it an accident or is it intentional is it was there a is is this a evidence that this is a, a purpose built in here this the same with the moon now i think to me personally it just seems more logical that you would conclude that no, it seems like this was designed this way. It seems like somebody planned it to be like this rather than it just, you know, accidentally happening. So that's the teleological argument. There's obviously many, many more things that you could uh, use. You can, and, and especially when you get into life on earth and, and man's position and all of that, there's so many, so many things that you could consider. But that takes us to the third argument. The third classical argument, this is the moral argument. The, mor the moral argument states that there must be a God to account for the universal sense of right and wrong among people. Now, now this is a fact that all people throughout all time in all places, and that doesn't mean there weren't one or two here or there that might not have figured this out, but generally speaking, um, there has been a consistent morality from culture to culture, from people to people, nation to nation. In other words, they've all pretty much thought the same things were wrong and the same things were right. Uh, somebody challenged uh, C.S. Lewis on this many years ago because the moral argument was, was a huge factor in his own experience. And he went and researched and documented all of these cultures and basically showed in his book, The Abolition of Man, how, how everybody pretty much believed the same things were right and they believed the same things were wrong. Now, l listen to what Lewis said about this. Lewis said this, he, he's explaining him his own experience. He says, my argument against God, now remember he was an atheist, my argument against God was that the universe seems so cruel and unjust. But how had I got this idea of, a, of just and unjust? A man does not call a line crooked unless he has some idea of a straight line. What was I comparing the universe with when I called it unjust? So Lewis explains that in his own experience, which ultimately led him to become a Christian, he began to realize that he was judging things by a standard that he hadn't set up. And so he argued for this, what, what he would call in mere Christianity, uh, the, the law of nature. And what he meant by the law of nature was that the law of human nature, that all human beings understood, or maybe didn't understand, but they actually uh, functionally lived according to these laws. So in his book, Mere Christianity, he uh, talks about uh, this this law of nature, and he uses this to prove that we all intuitively know that certain things are right or wrong, even though sometimes we, um, we will apply it. it. You know, when you hear about a double standard, what's happening with a double standard? Well, people are, uh, you know, they're, they're recognizing there's a, a standard, but they're wanting you to hold to it, but they're exempting themselves from it. We see this all the time in politics today. But Here's what Lewis said uh, later on after his own experience. He said, two points I want to make. First, that human beings all over the earth have this curious idea that they ought to behave in a certain way and cannot really get rid of it. So this is the law of human nature. They can't get rid of it. It's just, it's just built into us. We know. Now, some people have tried to say, well, it's cultural. You were brought up. Uh, and that, that's where the research proved that, no, it's not cultural. Everybody knows that murder is just wrong. Whether they were taught it, and even some cultures that glorify it, they still know it's wrong. Everybody knows that adultery is wrong, even though some cultures don't necessarily uh, look at it that way as far as their practice goes. But, but it's these kinds of things that Lewis said are a reality for everybody, and we can't get rid of it. Secondly, he said that they do not, in fact, behave in that way. So this is the law. Everybody knows there's a, a standard, but nobody actually lives up to it. They know the law of human nature. They break it. These two facts are the foundation of all clear thinking about ourselves and the universe we live in. 
So this is where, in Lewis's experience, this is where his atheism started to break down. And that's why he says these two facts are the basis for all clear thinking. Yeah, we, we have to think through these things. So that's the moral argument. And then fourthly, the argument from congruity. Uh, this is actually my favorite one of them all. And this argument is based on the belief that uh, the postulate or the, the hypothesis which best explains the related facts is probably true. Uh, in this particular case, belief in the existence of God best explains the facts of our moral, mental, and religious nature. Now, that's another thing that we didn't mention, but I'll throw it out here real quick. Uh, man is incurably, all people are incurably religious. See, atheism is actually religion because all human beings are religious. Now, people say, I'm not religious. I'm an atheist. No, that just means you don't worship the true God, but you worship some God. And many atheists worship at the altar of, of the intellect. They worship at the altar of man. But, but all people throughout all of time manifest themselves as intuitively religious. Everybody's religious. So uh, the argument from congruity is that our moral, mental, and religious nature, as well as the facts of the material universe, uh, without the postulate that God exists, uh, these facts are really inexplicable. So you, you can't, it doesn't make any sense if you think about this, this universal sense of right and wrong, if you think about the universal religious nature of man, um, if you take God out, it doesn't really make sense. It makes more sense if God's in the picture. So I was thinking about this, and um, and again, think with me about this for a moment. We're talking about the way things are, and here's the question. The way things are, are they more consistent with an atheist worldview or with a biblical worldview. And I argue that they're more consistent with a biblical worldview. The Bible really explains why things are the way they are. Now, the philosophers try to explain it, but nobody ever lands on any you know, definite thing. But the Bible really lays it out. But I, I was even thinking about things like this, just for example, think of this. Um, The Bible says that everything, this is going back to creation, the Bible says that everything is going to reproduce after its kind. And even though the evolutionists have argued against that for a couple centuries now, the fact of the matter is everything reproduces after its own kind. Now, they, they, they imagine a time when um, a lizard laid an egg and the egg cracked open and a bird flew out of it. But that has never happened. Nobody's ever seen that happen. Um, because what does happen? A lizard lays an egg and a lizard comes out of it. Uh, and all creatures reproduce after their kind. So that's what the Bible said it's going to be. That's the reality. Regardless of how you try to spin it, that is the reality. But here's another one that I think is interesting. Uh, the Bible says that man would have dominion over nature. And that's what we have, right? Now, there are people today who just, yeah, they, uh, there's one particular philosopher, an ethicist. I don't know how he is identified as an ethicist. His name is Peter Singer. And Peter Singer believes in what's called speciesism. And speciesism is the idea that, you know, there's all different kinds of species, and you're, you're just one species. But there's no difference between the species, and there's no superiority among the species. So, uh, in Peter Singer's mind, uh, it would be just as valid to save a baby pig as to save a baby human being from a fire. In, in his mind, he would prefer to save the pig, actually, over the human being. And this is where we see this stuff creeping into our culture. Where Did you hear a few weeks ago, a judge in New York understandable, the location, uh, he decided that, uh, I think it was a chimpanzee, actually had human rights. So that's what speciesism is, that, you know, ha have you noticed now, too, how, like, the great crime is to, if you do anything 
uh, you know, that's perceived as cruel to an animal, you are like the worst human ever. But we can have millions of abortions and nobody bats an eye. And actually people say, if, if you're against abortion, then you're the worst human ever. So this, this is the insanity that we have in our culture. But my point is this, man does have dominion over nature, uh, but it doesn't, why? <laughs> I mean, do you think, you know, there are lots of creatures more powerful than we are? There are creatures that can, you know, you look at any kind of a, you know, like a wild animal, like a bear or a shark or something like that. Um, you know, as far as physical strength, they outmatch us uh, so supremely. But what have we been able to do? We've been able to conquer all of these other animals. God said we would. And of course, because we're made in his image and he's given us our, our mind is how we've been able to do all of that, which the animals can't. So I think again, well, here's just another example of um, this is what the Bible says and this is what it looks like around me. Um, here's another one. Nature is bound to decay. Now, this is what we know today as the second law of thermodynamics, that everything is in a process of um, breaking down. And unless there's outside intervention, if left to itself, everything will ultimately fall apart. You know, the Bible actually says that that's the case. Romans 8, Paul speaks of the, of the creation itself being bond, in bondage to corruption or being in bondage to decay. In 1850, the scientists tacked a name on it. This is the second law of thermodynamics. So again, Bible says everything's in a process of decay. We look around, everything's in a process of decay. So, uh, on the other hand, the, 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 um, the atheist says, no, 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 everything's actually getting better. A man by the name of Steven Pinker, some of you might have heard of him, he recently wrote a book, and he's a humanist and, you know, very anti-Christ, and he basically says the world is the best it's ever been. It's wonderful. It is fabulous right now. It is just, it could, you know, could hardly get any better. I don't know what world he's looking at, but uh, that's his... That's his idea. Um, two more real quick. The universal or the universality of sin. The Bible says that we're all sinners. And is there anywhere that you can find a single person that will, by their life, refute that claim? No. And we even see it beginning to manifest itself in the earliest stages of life, don't we? I have a granddaughter who just turned four, and she is the apple of my eye. I love her so much, and she is so adorable, and she is so sweet. But I'll tell you, man, she, she can give her brothers a, a go, a run for their money, and just, you know, putting them in their place and telling them what to do. And, you know, she's got that, that aggressive side that will come out of her. That's human nature. It's fallen human nature so and then finally death how do you explain death well the bible explains death the bible tells us why there is death but you know the atheist can't tell us why there's death back at easter time i preached on the resurrection which you would understand i did that at easter time but i went through Hundreds and hundreds of quotes regarding death and going all the way back to, uh, you know, 2500 B.C., quoting people like Aristotle or Plato or, you know, e even, you know, Eastern uh, sages or, or whatever. And, you know, the thing that, that struck me was how basically nobody knew what in the heck they were talking about. Nobody. And then I read this one, and it was even on, uh, I even found it on Google. Um, I am he who is dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of the grave and death. And I thought, now there's somebody who knows what they're talking about. <laughs> and guess who that person was? That person was Jesus. So death is universal. Man has no explanation for it. The Bible has a perfectly clear explanation for it. So, so these are the, 
this is the, the argument from congruity. The, the, the postulate or the theory that best fits with reality is probably the right one. And I say to you that the Bible gives us uh, the best one. So as logical and interesting as these arguments might be to some, they are not the final word on whether God exists or not. The final word really, in the final analysis, the greatest argument for the existence of God is Jesus Christ himself. So even though these other things are interesting, even though these other things can be used to kind of get a conversation going or maybe to move a roadblock out of somebody's uh, way, therefore I think they're good to know, um, at the end of the day, Jesus is really the best argument for God's existence. Because how do you explain Jesus Christ if there's no God? He's pretty difficult to explain. Now some people say, well, he never lived in history. Well, you've got a ton of historians that are going to argue uh, to the death on that. Historians who aren't even Christians. The person, and you know, it's kind of popular on the internet today for people to say, oh, Jesus never existed. The people who say Jesus never existed are looked upon by the, you know, the, the historians who know as, you know, they're idiots. I mean, it, it's basically, that, that's how they look at them. It's absurd. Um, so let's think about this just really quick. But let me remind you of a, of a passage um, from Colossians chapter 1. Speaking of Christ, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. He is the image of the invisible God. God is invisible. How do we know there's a God? Well, Jesus came into the world to show us God. That's what he did. That's who he is. Now, really quickly, think about this. The prophecies. Jesus came into the world in fulfillment of prophecies. There were, there were hundreds of prophecies that spoke of his coming, spoke of uh, basically, you know, his family lineage, uh, the, the town of his birth, the, the time that he would arrive in history, the circumstances in which he would find himself. And, of course, it goes all the way into the intimate things of his, his betrayal, his innocence, his con, uh, being condemned and executed. And all of that was laid out prophetically before he even came. So you have his prophecies. You have the, the miraculous birth of Christ. Nobody else in history, this, this kind of thing. Now people say, oh, no, the Christians borrowed this virgin birth thing from the pagans around them. No, the pagans around them borrowed the virgin birth thing from the Christians. That's what they did. So this idea that somehow Christianity is just, a, you know, taking all of the stuff from the pagan religions and putting it together and coming up with Jesus is nonsense. Uh, a sinless life. Jesus lived a sinless life. He, he could even say to his enemies, which of you can convict me of sin? And none of them could, except they accused him of blasphemy, that he was a man making himself to be God. When you consider the teaching of Jesus, there's no teaching in history that compares with him. Uh, and then, of course, the miracles of Jesus. Nobody in the history of the world did the things that Jesus did. It's just no, no competition, no debate. There, there's no one else. Now, again, the, the skeptic, the atheist would say, oh, well, those things aren't true. They were just fabricated. They were just made up. Uh, but... What they don't realize is that the Bible is a historical record. The New Testament is, is a historical document. Times, dates, people, places, it's all there. You can do the research. And if these things were fake, uh, somebody would have been able to prove that by now, and nobody ever has. So you've got the miracles of Jesus. You've got his death, which the prophets said would be a substitutionary death for sin. And then you've got his resurrection, which is a claim that um, if you, again, if you do the research, uh, you'll find that there's, there's no other claim in history that has any better proof for it than the resurrection of Jesus. So, in the final analysis, Jesus is the greatest argument for the existence of God. So, don't forget that. 
and get to know everything you can about him. And of course, that happens primarily through his word. But you can get, you know, some additional information about some of the other facts. You can get that from other good resources as well. But I, I want to close with this. I'm going to close with quoting a man named Anthony Flew. Anthony Flew died a few years back uh, in his 80s. Uh, he was the world's foremost atheistic philosopher during the second half of the 20th century. So he was the guy who trained up all of the current um, atheists, the, the leading atheist. And he wrote a book just before he died, and the title of the book was There Is a God. And the subtitle of the book was How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Changed His Mind. And let me just close by reading to you what he said. He said, science cannot furnish an argument for God's existence, but the laws of nature, life with its teleological organization, and the existence of the universe can only be explained in light of an intelligence that explains both its own existence and that of the world. How it might be asked, do I, as a person, respond to the discovery of an ultimate reality that is an omnipresent, omniscient spirit? I must say again that my journey to my discovery of the divine has thus far been a pilgrimage of reason. A pilgrimage of reason. I have followed the argument where it has led me and it has led me to accept the existence of a self-existent, immutable, immaterial, omnipotent, and omniscient being. So basically, that's his statement that I am no longer an atheist. I have now, in, in all of these years, <laughs> through reason, this is the conclusion that I've come to. Then he says this, where do I go from here? In the first place, I am entirely open to learning more about the divine reality, especially in light of what we know about the history of nature. Second, the question of whether the divine has revealed itself in human history remains a valid topic of discussion. You cannot limit the possibilities of omnipotence. Speaking of God, if God's omnipotence, if he's all-powerful, you can't limit the possibilities except to produce the logically impossible. That's the only thing God can't do is produce the logically impossible. Everything else is open to omnipotence with particular reference to the Christian cl claim that God became a man, that God became man in the person of Jesus Christ, as I have said more than once, listen, here's the punchline, no other religion enjoys anything like the combination of a charismatic figure like Jesus and a first-class intellectual like Paul. If you are wanting omnipotence, if you're wanting a God to set up a religion, it seems to me that this is the one to beat. That's pretty heavy coming from the world's most notorious atheist. Um, the sad thing is nobody knows whether he ever received Christ before he died, but he did make this statement and was surrounded actually by many uh, capable Christians. So. so the classical arguments for the existence of God, the cosmological, the teleological, the moral argument, the argument from congruity, but the ultimate argument is Jesus. <laughs>